Funding for Current Conversations is provided by University of Oklahoma President's Office, University of Oklahoma Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. Today we're going to be talking about trends in higher education, innovations on college and university campuses over the last 20 years, and where things are headed in the next 10 years. We have with us a national expert on trends in higher education, Dr. James Pappas, who is Vice President of Outreach and Dean of the College of Liberal Studies at the University of Oklahoma. If we're going to be talking about what's happened, we'll start here, with what's happened with higher education over the last 20 years, what would the headline be, if there's going to be a headline for this? Would it be uh, technology reshapes everything, or, or, or what maybe one or two headlines would you expect yeah, to see? Yeah, I think that would be certainly one of the significant ones, is technology changes higher education. I think um, another one might be something like uh, the emergence of for-profits um, institutions. Um, I think the the third one might be the changing political climate. Reduced funding. Reduced and, funding. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the movement away from um, sort of higher education as a public good mm -hmm. to more uh, higher education as a private kind of good. It's, it seems like most anything we could mention the technology. Um, the rise of for-profits or whatever, there's a kind of good news and bad news. On the, on the technology side, isn't that mainly good news, though? Uh, more resources in the classroom and access to knowledge, access to a lot of knowledge. I mean, that's really shaped things a lot in the way we teach. Yeah, I don't think there's any question there. Um, the technology has made a significant change in the way that we've approached, you know, the learning teaching kind of endeavor. Um, the, the thing that's a bit of a struggle right now, as I see it, is we're still in the emerging period of technology. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the challenges is um, how we start to learn to use technology in the best way it can be used. I think one of the things that's happened is we've ended up with taking the classroom and trying to replicate it with technology. Yeah, yeah. And, and that really may not be the best use of technology. We're just now starting to understand that technology can bring a lot of things to the learning environment that, that are different than simply replicating. I don't hear people say that very much, but it really seems to make a lot of sense. It's a work in progress. You know, you either hear it's going to do all the teaching and almost all the learning for people, these idealistic uh, expectations, or it's just uh, a disaster, we need to get back to face to face. And you're saying it's probably not really one or the other, it's a work in progress and we're still trying to figure out how to do it. Absolutely. And the thing that makes it a challenge is there's some new technology that emerges, the old cliche, every 18 months. And so what's going to be kind of interesting is to see how we can you know, technology is indeed a work in progress. I think what's happened is we've just started to look at technology uh, in terms of what it can do that's different. You know, a technology uh, in terms of what it can do that's different. You know, up to this point, what we've done is tried to replicate the classroom. We do lecture capture, we show that. Uh, you know, we take text instead of a book. But I think in the future, one of the things we're going to see is that technology will increase the ways that we can learn. Mm -hmm. um, the availability of all kinds of information on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, open educational resources, capturing when you have a discussion of politics, the latest uh, presidential conference. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many things that can be done with technology that we haven't done very well to this point. And, mm -hmm. and I think technology will continue to change. For example, we don't know exactly what will happen with these mobile devices, mm -hmm. but it'll allow learning on the go. You know, you may mm -hmm. be able to text a student and say, 
if you'll you know go to the internet internet right now this national figure is talking about this issue that we dealt with in class last week mm -hmm. or we can create communities of learners you know through the social media so technology really opens a lot of doors that we haven't gone through yet we're still figuring absolutely. out how to go through those absolutely i doors. still think we're thinking about it and one of the unfortunate things i think is that much of the technology innovation has come from the technologists. Mm -hmm. They show us how to do something different with technology. Mm -hmm. I hope that in the future, one of the things that will emerge is more and more educators will become sufficiently good at technology that they will then use those tools to in fact enhance the learning process. You know, listening to you, I, I it makes me think that a lot of what people have Try, have said to sort of characterize the last 20 years, a sort of crisis in education, really may not be right. It sounds like you're saying that the technology, even the reduced funding, uh, even the higher tuition, that it's maybe shaken education out of a, kind of a complacent position. So there's a sort of series of challenges that are happening, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? No, I think what you're saying is absolutely true. Now, I think there are some things happening that are, uh, that I think are unfortunate in higher education. Uh, I think the, the crisis that's implied with technology is not one of those. I think that uh, technology will help us. I don't think it provides the promise that everyone hoped would be there. <laughs> Just not in itself. Not, it's not in and of itself. Right. And, and especially this whole idea that now we're going to be able to do away with colleges and they yeah. will be replaced by technology. That's not going to happen. Right. Um, I think this whole MOOC issue with uh, massive open courses, uh, those things I don't think are going to be what we saw in the public media and in some of the political commentaries, the things that are going to emerge. Yeah. The assumption that we're going to do away with higher education because it'll be replaced by technology. It's not going to happen. No, but it sounds like you're, one of the points you're making though, there was a kind of comfort level in higher education, maybe because funding was so great, sort of post Sputnik. There was so much money just thrown into higher education that we didn't worry very much about outcomes or what was actually happening. Uh, there was just enough money to go around. Why worry about it? But with reduced funding and the possibility of technology, uh, those assumptions just aren't aren't going to be safe anymore. We have to really look at outcomes. Yeah, I, don't know. I think you're absolutely right. I think that uh, when we had sufficient funding, and there were two ways that we had funding. One was we had uh, greater public support, especially for the public universities, and even some privates got public funds. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is is that uh, tuition was sufficiently available that it wasn't a problem. So in many ways, we tended to do what we had always done. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happening now... And people weren't asking too many questions about that. They weren't asking that. questions. Yeah. Uh, in many ways, the concept of the Ivy Tower was real. Um, yeah. You know, the goal was to simply send your children to college. They'd get their degrees and come out. And everything they needed to know was in their heads and right. for their entire lifetime, that was higher education. And whether they'd actually learned anything that yeah, was useful yeah, no. or made a better life, those were questions they didn't those, worry we, too much about. We didn't about. question those things. Um, so I think what's happened is, is that some of the challenges we're facing are also sort of forcing us to look at you know, what's happening in higher education, how can we do it better? Well, let's, let's move into the present a little bit more. So if the headline for the past was technology advances, reduced funding, would the headline for the present be something like education regrouping? You know, I mean, it seems like we're in a period where we're trying to learn from the past and there are these challenges for the future. Would that be a fair thing to say? I think that'd be fair, whether we want it or not in higher education. Okay. It's going to occur. Okay. I think, uh, you know, recent headlines uh, indicate that a number of governors now are calling for massive cutbacks in higher education funding. Mm -hmm. Uh, as we said, technology is changing at an increasing, accelerating rate. Mm -hmm. So it gives us new tools. Uh, and yet there's a kind of urgency about all of this that I'm not sure comes through the news. 
that, that you could call national security or whatever you want, if the country's uh, effort in higher education isn't successful, the, uh, the ramifications down the road are pretty serious for us, aren't they? Oh, I think dramatically so. I think personally, one of the competitive advantages that the United States has always had is its higher education system. You know, whether we've invented new kinds of degrees like MBAs, whether we've depended on research and uh, scholarly work to develop new ideas, mm -hmm. those are the things that's a, that have enhanced national competitiveness. And the other thing that was neat is our higher education institutions, in many ways, though not perfect, prepared people to go out into the workforce. And that was something that in many other parts of the world really wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. So we had some real advantages as we cut back on higher education. I think one of the things that happens is we reduce that competitiveness. Mm -hmm. And my concern is, is that's happening at exactly the same time that international institutions are now mimicking American higher education mm -hmm. and more and more countries are seeing education as the basis for they're being competitive. Well, what about the traditional notion, uh, and you hear this all the time, that what higher education is really about is citizen preparation. You know, if you're gonna be part of a democracy, you need to know the lay of the land, what's happening culturally and politically out there, at least at some rudimentary level, or you're not gonna be a very good citizen. You're not gonna participate very much. And what about that as a, as a goal? I mean, that's certainly been the goal in the past, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. I think if we go back historically. Is that disappearing, to, that kind yeah, of education? Oh, I think there is no question. And that's going to be one of the challenges that we have in the future. How do we balance that? Because uh, my concern is, whichever side of the partisan aisle you look at, there's more and more emphasis on higher education as simply a career option. Yeah. And um, It's the old story. If there's not quite enough money, then you do triage. What is absolutely at the top of the list? People have got to work, they've got to survive. So we get we narrow down to a career path. And I think the unfortunate thing with that is that one of the other pieces that made us competitive, I think, was having a very strong democracy. Mm -hmm. And while it's a, it's a pretty uh, esoteric concept, I think the one thing that we saw, particularly in general education, was the preparation of those students to indeed be good citizens. Right. To think through about issues and facts, to think through what government meant and so on. I think as we focus so directly on just careers and we lose some of that general education, mm -hmm. broad-based knowledge, we may also lose some of the strength of our citizenship. Something that I think people probably would like to hear an explanation for, just a little bit of a kind of mystery out there. What is a MOOC to begin with? And maybe we can talk about what happened with MOOCs. Well, what is a MOOC? Uh, a MOOC is a massive uh, open online course. Okay. And basically MOOCs were created um, with the idea that people could take the course, simply uh, log in on some sort of... Uh, you know, technology device, and and follow the learning. Most MOOCs had... Without paying anything. Just, without paying anything. Yeah, and yeah. that was the important thing, is that that it was supposed to be free. Doesn't seem like much of a business model right there. It, it, was, a, it was a weak business model. Yeah. I think uh, there was a lot of expectations that it would work out. There were a lot of groups that came together... Um, uh, particularly the Ivy Leagues in edX was the name of one of the mar large organizations and several others that came together and tried to do that. The unfortunate thing, of course, was there wasn't any funding for it. Right. Uh, the other thing that was a problem with it is, was the credentialing. Yeah, yeah. While a lot of people came to those massive courses to learn about things, once they went there, they found they weren't as exciting as they thought they would be. Right. I think many people saw it as another way of a video program. And uh, so as a result, a lot of people would start a course, never finish it. And now what we're seeing is that many of the organizations are also charging. So in some ways, it's competitive with 
the more traditional online courses. You know, courses. I bring it up because when there's something like that that on the face of it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, here's this free course and universities that have to have money are putting these free courses up, usually there's something else being served. And I'm, I'm just, is this part of the, the sort of unbundling where we're, we're now starting to see how people learn uh, in the classroom and we can unbundle the classroom and break that up and unbundle the curriculum a little bit. That word unbundling seems to come up a lot. And I'm wondering if that's not what was really going on with the MOOCs, just a sort of attention to how we can break up the university experience. Yeah, let, I think there may be three pieces there. Let's, okay. Let's take the first one, and that is that I think there was a lot of public hype. Mm -hmm. And so once MOOCs occurred, the media grabbed it and uh, wanted to talk a lot about it mm -hmm. and saw it as a way of creating a story that would be the end of colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and so the public media basically drove that in the first part of its activity. Um, the second thing, and this is where I think higher education does have problems, is we're lemmings. <laughs> we follow the leaders. Right. And many of the MOOCs initially came out of uh, the Ivy Leagues, so everyone wanted to replicate that. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of MOOCs emerging, even though, as you say, the business model was not a good one. Yeah. Uh, but I think the thing that has happened, not with just MOOCs, but with uh, technology generally, is that it has raised the question of, do we need to have colleges and universities existing in the same format that mm -hmm. they currently exist in? And your term is the one that's been used a lot. You hear that, that a lot, Unbu unbundling, unbundling the classroom, unbundling the curriculum. And, and what does that mean? Breaking what universities traditionally have offered down into parts that people may want and let, let other parts go? Absolutely. I think uh, if you look at online education, if you look at the for-profits, and if you look at some of the promises of MOOCs, what they essentially did was say, we need an instructor, we need the technology, and we need the content. Mm -hmm. But we don't need the other pieces that often make a university. Or maybe and, I don't even need a whole course. Maybe I just yeah. want one line of thought Absolutely. And I want to get a badge or a certificate or whatever is a result of learning. You can that. have a micro course. And yeah. in fact, m one of the most uh, successful uh, technology programs is the Khan Academy, mm -hmm. which takes math and teaches it in small pieces. But I think the unbundling is one of the challenges we'll face. Do we need a student affairs office that provides counseling, that provides mm -hmm. all the other advising? Uh, do we need an athletic program? Uh, you know, do we need a residential setting? Um, mm -hmm. Many of the things that, that have become part of higher education and are useful in terms of the socialization process of 18 to 22 year olds now can be unbundled. And the question becomes, is that unbundling good? Is it useful? So on. One of the problems with higher education, it's a very diffuse product. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very hard to know what it is you really need. Right. And so it's easy for segments of the marketplace to say, I want this piece. Right. Which unbundled, you may be able to get. The unfortunate thing, it, it always, uh, it doesn't always translate into a good outcome right. for education. Well, so, your point, and it's a long-term point, it'd be very important. if. Uh, focusing on career paths means we're not doing general education so well, and that means we're not going to be producing citizen participants for the culture down the road. That's really that's really going to hurt us. Maybe cost efficient now to get rid of general education, but we're going to pay the price uh, later. Absolutely, I think we'll pay the price in terms of citizenship, but I think we'll pay the price in terms of the society we live in. Yeah. For example, if I'm not good at art appreciation. Mm -hmm. How will I value art if I haven't had a general education course in music? You know, what will I think of music and what will happen there? Um, if I haven't thought through critically some of the issues around history and around politics and around government, then what does that mean as I go out and I'm a citizen? So, so a lot of pieces that aren't easily identified 
are part of that broader educational outcome. Well, I, that, that's a, such a strong point, but I, I think the point could even be made from a business standpoint. If uh, we know that most people these days in the future, these days and in the future, are going to be changing jobs three to five times over a, a lifetime, and they're not prepared, to, they don't have the flexibility to move into other areas because they didn't have a general education, they're not going to be very effective in, in the workforce either. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you're preaching to the choir here because yeah. I'm a continuing educator, but I think that's really true. I think the future is going to be, you know, ongoing, lifelong education. How do we continue to learn how to learn? And if we haven't prepared our students because we've been so focused on one content area, mm -hmm. you know, what's going to happen? The other thing that we hear, and and this is one that's fairly common in the public media as well, is that many of our students don't know how to write. Many of them don't know how to do critical thinking. Many don't know how to synthesize an argument. And so we end up with a society that are sort of single issue yeah. kind of uh, thinking. I'm glad you bring that up. There are some skills that you can't just grab really quickly in a couple of encounters with some curriculum that would really take a, a commitment over time, like writing and critical thinking uh, to develop, yeah. Would the, possibly the headline for the next 10 years, we're still playing this out with headlines, be something like higher education gets better results with less, with, with less support? Uh, I think whether we like it or not, that's what it's going to be. We hopefully, it's yeah. going to be that we're getting better yeah, results. We're getting with, better. Uh, yeah. I think both pieces there are important. One is, I think from what we're seeing, we're going to continue to see an erosion of public support, particularly for the public universities. Um, and so that's going to force So that's that. ongoing. Don't, that's don't on, get your hopes up that we're going to see more money. I we're don't probably think not. we're going to see more money. I think there's a couple of things driving that. And, and one is, at least in the heartland, and I think for most of the country, we're seeing a greater and greater desire for less and less taxes. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be one of the issues. I think we're, we're not going to be able to increase tuition as quickly as we have in the last decade. It's gone up a lot. Of yeah, that, so yeah. a lot of students now are saying, I don't want to have a lot of debt. Give, so, me, give me something, if, if you wouldn't mind. If there's something on the horizon that's just a little troubling to you, it could happen in higher education over the next 10 years, but you would rather it not, what would that be? Well, I'm very concerned about the research enterprise. Okay. Um, I think we've, we've heard, both in the political arena and the public media, the idea that um, we have to have teaching. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, what we're saying is, let's replicate in higher education what we have in public education. Mm -hmm. So basically, a professor is a teacher. Right. Now, I'm not saying the professor shouldn't be a good teacher, but one of the other characteristics of higher education is that professors also do research. And universities have historically been that place where, where research can have basically uh, core kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. What we see is an erosion in research in the corporate setting. And universities have been the ones that have continued to give us that competitive advantage. It's given the United States a huge advantage. A yeah. major advantage. And so if we take that away from higher education, which many people are arguing we should, mm -hmm. then where is the, is the basic research going to occur for our nation? Very important question. Uh, just a few seconds left. What's got you most excited about the next 10 years and developments in higher education? Well, I think lifelong education. I think whether it's technology, uh, providing a new way of learning, or whether it's uh, you know having all the information available, that's what excites me. And the other thing is, is with the rapid change of knowledge, you're going to have to have something like that. And I think higher education, if it is effective, will try and capture that piece of the future, the lifelong learning for all of us. Dr. James Pappas, thank you very much for being with us today. I'm glad that you could be with us today. Please join us next time for more Current Conversation. Thank you for watching.